Welcome to PS Coffee U 2020. It's great to see everyone, well, kind of see everyone. I'm joined today, and I'm really tickled by this, by none other than the team lead engineer, Steve Lee. Hey, Steve. Hello. <laughs> As Steve waves. Hey, folks, look, we're here to talk about the shell, modernizing and the next gen to the shell. And I'm so glad that Steve is with us. In fact, why don't we just go ahead and dive in and Talk, we'll take a look at the agenda and get started. So let me share my screen. And here we go. I'm going to minimize the little picture down here. So modern and next gen shell. And really, let me just get right. Uh, first of all, thanks to all the sponsors. Very important. Thank you to all the sponsors. Really appreciate supporting PS Comp EU. It's very important to everyone that works with PowerShell. Now, for our agenda, we want to talk about why we want to modernize the shell. Some of the things that we've been thinking about and talking about, and you'll notice this, you may have already seen this in PowerShell 7, um, taking a look at error messages. And so we want to take a quick look at those error messages again and why we made some of those changes. But we also want to let you inside on some early work. And this is very early work. And we've we've had some wonderful experiences with the engineers getting some demos ready for us and some demos that we're gonna do. So we're gonna look at some things like native commands and utility completers. Wow, I wonder if PowerShell could make it, it, it easier to run Linux, <laughs> even on Linux. And we'll also talk about one of my favorite things, predictive intelligence and, and dynamic help. So Steve, let's just kind of dive right in here um, and take a look at why modernizing the shell. Now, what I did is I, I put up a couple of definitions here for us. Um, for both modernize and next gen, and you know, just generic definitions. Uh, you know, to modernize is to adapt to modern needs or habits, and and from our perspective on looking at modernize, I mean, when you kind of look at things and you look at PowerShell, PowerShell is is well, it probably could use just a little bit of updating compared to maybe some of the other things that people have been thinking about and inventing out there to kind of bring it up to speed. What do you think? Well, I think what a lot of people who are um, in computers for a long time, like myself, you know, we started in the shell. Like I was a classic Unix user before I moved to Windows. So being in the shell for me was very natural. And, and it feels like today, like the shell has kind of come back again and is like this really uh, cool thing, like with the Windows terminal, um, you know, and with us being cross-platform, you know, Linux and Mac OS, I think a lot of people are now back in the shell and, and finding it that you can be actually much more productive in the shell especially if you're trying to scale out and do automation versus being in the GUI. So I think this is a good opportunity for us to look at what are the, the latest trends in not just the shelf, but like just, you know, in, in the computers and see what can we do to make it more productive and actually more enjoyable to use. And, and that's the, the goal I have set for like PowerShell. And we have some great examples uh, during our demos that we could show us some of the modernization, but we're also going to be talking about a couple of things that we refer to as next generation. In other words, going beyond um, where we're at today. And, you know, it's really some of that next generation stuff that is that is very exciting, but it's also kind of difficult. I mean, it's it's very risky and it's very challenging. Um, you know, I think we got some very exciting stuff and, and some of the stuff that we're working on, which we're going to be talking about in this presentation, isn't necessarily part of PowerShell itself, but stuff that we're doing as a module outside of PowerShell, but the two work together. Well, and when we look at why to modernize, it, it kind of comes down to, as Steve was kind of mentioning, at the end of the day, it's really about making you more successful sooner. Uh, the idea is, is the more successful you can be sooner working with PowerShell, both in discovering the technologies you're working with, and if you're already experienced, accelerating you to the solution in those technologies. Well, if you get there sooner, then you're going to be happier using PowerShell and you want to come back to PowerShell. So it's important that we both modernize and that we add in next gen. And let's face it, it's part of the, the sacred vow, that promise that if you made it up that learning curve of, of PowerShell, well then PowerShell should solve your needs for even with newer technologies. And I think over the last, what is it now, Steve, 14 years, I think we've kind of yeah. proven that. And it, it kind of points out that evolution in technology is always messy, right? And so hundreds of new commandlets, hundreds of, or not commandlets, but hundreds of new technologies and thousands of new commandlets. And there's a bunch of, now as Steve, you were just talking about, a resurgence of the shell means a resurgence of a lot of new native commands that get very complicated. All of this means we got to stay on our toes and that we want to keep 
improving the shell as best we can. Now, the improvements that we're looking at, yeah, it's going to be for new and occasional users so that they get hints sooner to make them successful sooner. But this is also for both the regular and advanced users. Sometimes working with commandlets, that's how you figure out a new technology. It teaches you the technology. But more importantly, if you're an advanced user, any attempt to accelerate, like what was that command? Well, finding that command, finding out the length, all of the pipelining to that command and executing it sooner makes it even better. As a matter of fact, in some of this modernization, one of the first things that Steve and I worked on together was improving error messages. And let me flip over, Steve, to Windows 5.1 and bring up a, a traditional uh, Windows PowerShell 5.1 error message. I think some of the feedback that we've gotten from uh, the Windows PowerShell users over time that it really took a while to address is really, and what uh, Jason's going to show is like, you know, when you get an error, you get this big screen full of red text. And especially for novice users, it can be very intimidating because like, what does that mean? How to interpret that? What did I do wrong? Um, and really one of the things we want to tackle was how to make that uh, you know, more direct so you don't have to worry about information that's not ne um, necessary for you, um, but also provide ability so you can get more information um, so you can actually figure out what's wrong. You know, and I, and, and I just want to point out that there was nothing really really wrong with these error messages. As a matter of fact, these error messages were great. It's just it kind of obfuscated some of the important information that I needed to see. And, and to your point, you make a couple of errors and your screen fills with red really fast, right? <laughs> so, so working with these errors and all of that, it, it can become a little bit challenging. But if we move to PowerShell uh, 7, and I, I do the same command, get item, and we'll just do path to nowhere, now you get, well, it doesn't matter how I spell it, it's still in error. Now you get a very clear, clean, and concise message. And, and Steve, it's, it's, it just points right out to me right away. Get item, can't find the path, very easy to read. But I want to point out to, to folks that if I did something different, like divide by zero, the first part of the error message changes, right? So it can tell us whether it's a commandlet, whether it's a runtime exception, that kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah, I think that's the key part is really we, we spend a lot of time um, thinking about this and really trying to make it sure like the information that is uh, the default view that we're giving you now, this concise view, is really the information that's necessary to make you successful, to figure out what's wrong and how to fix it. Now, the interesting thing, and yeah, I will point out how you can change the preference variable error view for this um, in just a, a couple of minutes, but um, something else that I want to point out, and this is what I, I have to tell you, Steve, I think this was the, the, the brilliant stroke and, and it was pretty amazing. I'm going to run a script. Now, this is a really simple script. Uh, um, matter of fact, it only has one error in it, as you can tell. <laughs> but when you're running a script and an error comes from a script, it's not this concise error message. It's a much more detailed error, error message. Can you explain this? Yeah, so I think one of the things we recognize is that if you're uh, running a script, you need to get more contextual information to figure out, uh, you know, if you like a thousand line script, like where the problem was uh, and things like that. Uh, so we, in this case, we actually borrowed some of the uh, visualization elements from Rust. Um, it's not exactly, but we made some customizations for ourselves and we kind of really had uh, also leveraged coloring to kind of separate some of the data and the metadata. So it makes it much easier to, to see, it, especially from a distance or from up close, like exactly what the problem is and where the problem is make it much easier to troubleshoot. Yeah, and I really, uh, I think that's what really, for me at least, really, really nails it, is that it, it gives me a visualization so that when I jump back into my code, that I already know where I'm looking and what I'm looking for. I've got a great a way to engage quickly. But, you know, uh, oh, I do want to point this out. Um, everybody remembers that, well, I hope everybody remembers, you could get more details about error messages from, uh, dollar sign error. But now, if you wanted to see more details on this error message, um, Steve, we included get error, right? Yeah. Like one of the key thinkings um, along this was if we have a concise error message, um, you don't want to now have to inspect the dollar error variable uh, and know which one to index and all that stuff to figure out you know, more detailed information to troubleshoot. So now we create this command that uh, to make it much easier, get actually a lot more information than you actually got in the original uh, red error text. Well, it, the the best part though is Steve, and we were chatting about this. I, I really like 
Now, this is great if you're working in the console, and I spend a lot of time working in the console, but you probably, as I do, spend a lot of time actually in VS Code, writing code, and how do these errors work there? And what I want to do is I want to bring up, uh, yeah, I'm on my Mac, and I'm just going to bring up uh, uh, code, and oh, that's, that's actually what I want to take a look at. I've got a, a script that has, well, more than one error in it. And, you know, Steve, this is where um, things get uh, really nice and interesting in VS Code. So as I, I'm just maximizing my screen a little bit here, and I'm going to go ahead and run this, and it's just going to create a whole bunch of errors, which can often happen. No, don't, no, don't try to upgrade me right now. Just run. And so I get a long list of errors, but what I really like about this is, again, not only does this help me visualize it, but this is clickable. And if I is it command click on this it takes me up here and you may not have seen it on the video but it takes me right to the line puts my cursor on the line so i can get right to work on it so steve this it, it, it's been helping me a lot for somebody like you do you find this really helpful oh absolutely like in fact this is a specific change that we made where we detect that if we're running vs code we actually add the column information which you would normally not get in the console um, because you can't click it doesn't it's not as useful so if you have another error in there that is not going to be on column one, like maybe that fourth one. Oh, yeah, yeah like this one. If you click on that, then it should take you to uh, line seven and then um, column 96 where the error is. So definitely, it does. yeah, this will make you much more productive. It does it to put the cursor right there where the problem was. So right where you see the red squiggly. So yeah, I totally agree. This has been a huge improvement, both in productivity and really for me, helping to visualize what I need to get back into to work with. Um, just a few notes on this, uh, uh, folks, while we take a look, while we get ready to move on to new and other things is uh, this was released in PowerShell 7. It, uh, uh, the, the preference variable dollar sign error view is now set to concise view. It used to be normal view. Those options are still there, both normal view and category view, and you can always switch back to those if you prefer, but quite honestly, I don't know why you would want to switch from these. Um, yeah. And what I really enjoy uh, most about these is that you get a different error based upon whether you're working interactive at the console when you want a really concise error. So it doesn't blow away your screen. You can see your previous work, keep working. But when you're working with uh, a script, you get a great error message, helps you visualize that error in the script. And always with Get Error, you get more details. Well, you all may have seen this already, of course, because you're certainly running PowerShell 7, but there are a few other things that we want to talk about. And in this case, Steve, uh, we're not going to start with a demo. And maybe you could help me talk about this, but I'd like to talk about native commands. And this is commands that exist or that are being created. These are just regular commands. They're not PowerShell commands. They're just power. They're just regular commands like kubectl that um, you might be working with. And what we'd like to be able to do is improve that experience. C command line tools are growing right now. As Steve pointed out at the very beginning, the shell is popular once again, which is awesome. And you've got a lot of complex tools. Some of these are so complex, they're almost like their own mini little scripting languages in there. So kubectl, sysctl, docker, all of those. And here, Steve, is some of the challenges. A, a lot of us know that you know we could take these native commands and we could just wrap them, or we could check for to see if there's a Swagger doc for the, its API. These are really challenging, though. Um, why are we looking at something different for this? Why do, are these the challenge? Yeah, I think so. Let me uh, before I tackle that, I want to I want to make sure like something that seems lost sometimes uh, with folks who are PowerShell users is that they don't think that PowerShell is just a shell and they can use any native command with it. And they always think, why can't I get a commandment for that, right? Um, so there are many cases why you want a commandment because we have consistency, discoverability, and all that stuff. Um, but you know, we want to make sure that native commands work. Now, with that said, we also want to make it so that you have a better experience if you're using some uh, well-known native commands in PowerShell. Uh, so I'll pick on Docker, for example, where uh, Microsoft previously had this project on GitHub where they were producing a Docker uh, PowerShell module. And one of the challenges there is always trying to keep it up to date. When you have a, a very active project like Docker at the time, like how, how often, or how many resources, and how often you want to update that module to make sure you have all, always the latest capability. Um, and it's very challenging because uh, the, the module would always be behind 
the native command through the nature that the native command is the source of truth, right? So um, as far as I know, that project is kind of uh, stale at this point and not being updated. And, you know, one of the things we looked at is how do we avoid that situation, right? Um, so uh, Jim on the team, Jim Truer, uh, came with this novel idea where basically we can leverage some of the metadata that we get out of native commands. And this won't work for all commands, but actually a lot of commands, especially on Linux, um, on Mac OS, and even some on Windows, have some consistency in terms of how they present help information. Um, so we can parse that out and actually generate commandlets um, based on that and you actually can get some of the benefits of PowerShell and still get the full functionality of the native command. And what Jim's uh, working on right now is to make this framework for, for doing this extensible. And this removes, this actually kind of just takes the command, lets the command run itself and builds PowerShell off of it. So I, the, it sounds to me like the updating challenge is almost entirely removed. I, I know that that was the, one of my big challenges in trying to maintain um, uh, something that was wrapped was the constant maintenance and with today's technology changing so fast. But now with this model, it should be able to generate its own commandlets, even if it gets updated, right? That's correct. Now there is uh, a caveat there, right? Because any kind of brute force generation is not gonna be perfect. Because uh, if right. you look at the auto rest case, right? Where it's basically a developer oriented API and you generate commandlets. Now you have commandlets that look like APIs. Uh, and that's not a great experience. Now the nice thing about native commands is that native commands are inherently um, IT pro DevOps oriented. Um, they're more like you know yeah. match operations. So there is a nice uh, mapping between that and what a command should do. But there's still this problem where um, what is the right verb? What is the right noun? Um, are there parameters that map to uh, you know well known parameters that we should be using? So we we now have this concept, and we we see this already like in CDXML and also even in auto rest generated commandlets where we have this metadata that can say hey. Uh, let's say in Docker, it's like uh, Docker run. Uh, you know, run is actually not a verb in partial, so maybe it's a uh, start Docker, right? Something like that. So, um, what I'm hoping is that we can still generate this stuff, but we can rely on the community to help kind of like add this metadata so you actually have a much better uh, partial experience than what we generate um, artificially. And based upon what you just said, then then let me say to everybody, so obviously we need your help and your feedback. Now, here's here's the best part. In a moment, we're going to show you a demo of this. It's pretty cool. But hang on a second, because there's a couple of other, other things. And Steve, you know, you've brought this up several times. Native yeah. commands should just work in PowerShell. And, and, and so how are you thinking about this moving forward? So I think one of the frustrations I've seen myself and also from users is, you know, like, again, if you're picking up a new um, technology like uh, Kubernetes or Docker or something like that, you see some tutorial on a wiki or a web page, you see some commands, you kind of paste it into PowerShell. In some cases, and like in most cases, it actually just works, but in some cases, it doesn't work. Um, and we, some of the work that we're doing in 7.1 is figuring out, hey, what are those cases and how can we make like the parsing better in PowerShell so that we actually can figure out what you're intended and make sure you don't get an error um, and it should just work. And it, it's very challenging because one of the trade-offs we have to make is, is it a breaking change? And how do we handle that? Where if somebody had already worked around this problem before in the past, um, does that workaround still work or not, right? So it's not easy to solve. Right, and I think to your point, it's not easy, easy to solve, it's complicated. And so we have to take baby steps. Uh, a great example is something, and I think you just blogged about this, right? Or uh, right. blogged recently about PS native PS path resolution. You want to tell everybody? This is pretty cool. Yeah, so this was uh, a feature that I actually wrote that shipped in the last preview. Um, one of the frustrations I've had like, when I'm working on Windows is I want to use utility to mean my home directory, and Windows itself doesn't understand what that means. That's a purely a partial concept in Windows. Um, and then yeah. on non Windows, like even on my, my, on my MacBook, if I want to just create a temporary file and Maybe not everyone's aware of this, but in PowerShell 7, we have this temp drive now that always points to the user temporary folder. Um, I just want to create a temporary file and I want to use the PS drive. Guess what? Native commands don't understand what that PS drive means. So the change here is really two things. If the beginning of your path is a PowerShell drive and it maps to the file system, we'll resolve that to the actual file system path. Um, and then similarly on Windows, if it starts with utility, then we map that to your home directory. So now, you can just do the examples there. It's like you can you can do like a nano or vi to a temp file, or you can do notepad to a, a file in your home directory, and that should just work as you'd expect because we resolved the path so the native command works with that. 
And I think it's important to point out uh, a key thing that you said there was that it's it's the PS drive that points to a real file system. It, 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 it's not for like the registry provider, that kind of thing, right? That's correct. Like if, if it's, uh, if it happens to be a registry provider or notice man provider or something like that, then it'll be treated as a literal and it will fail or succeed depending on what you intended. <laughs> and I'll just also say similarly, like if you need to have a literal uh, name that has, that looks like a PS drive and potentially maps to PS drive, then you just use single quotes and it'll be treated as a literal. Like we won't resolve it to the native command. It'll, it'll, it'll get what you passed. And hey, by the way, man, thanks a lot for the tilde. Really love that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was a big deal. Um, now, just to let everybody know, we do have a great demo, and I'm going to launch this demo. This is a video that oh, Jim Truer put together. So remember, Jim Truer is one of the original team members, and he's working on the native commands, and he wants to talk to you about well, what he's doing with those native commands and show you an example using kubectl. So I'm going to roll the video. Here we go. Hi, I'm Jim Truer. I'm a senior software engineer on the PowerShell team, and I have been investigating how to take advantage of native executables in a PowerShell environment by wrapping them in proxy functions. I have chosen to experiment in the kube control or the Kubernetes environment using the kube control executable because it has very regularized help and I can actually run the Kubernetes, the kube control application, collect the help and automatically generate all of these prox all these functions. So if we actually look at the uh, module that I have been working on, we can take a look at it, it and it's basically very simple to start. You can see there's only half a dozen or so uh, ex execute uh, functions there, and there are a couple of ones that are interesting. Initialize proxy function is the one that is going to actually create all the functions that that are based on the re results of the get kube resource which is a application that's part of the module so if i import this module now that i can get i can run get command on the module itself And you can see that there's a large number of of new new modules, uh, new functions that have been uh, created in this environment. And I can run these these functions, and they fully participate in the PowerShell ecosystem. They re they return objects. They actually can take parameters. If I say give me kube resources or give me your kube resources with a name that has a pod in it. That returns me all of those things that have uh, names pod. And you can see also that these are objects by simply changing the name and the kind and the verbs. And so I'm actually dealing with the objects created by my proxy function that returns me an object so I can filter it like I would normally do. Now I can actually then run and get that resource. And those are all the pods that I have that are running, and I can use those with fil the usual filtering uh, tools that I have, you know, where for each. And so all of this is fitting into uh, the PowerShell ecosystem very nicely. Sometimes I don't know how to map the objects that I'm getting from the kube control uh, application to uh, the, a regular object so I can actually return the, the JSON, a set of JSON that represents the object is simply by doing that. So once you have this object, of course, you can then use that. And through configuration, you can actually create maps to what properties you want to see that are contained in the JSON object. In the very infancy of doing all of this work, 
So far, I've been able to automatically generate a number of commands in classes. And welcome back. I, Jim's video is, a, is amazing, but you can see where we're the direction that we're kind of headed. You can also see that this is early days. We've got a lot of thoughts on this, but we really want your thoughts on this as well. And to join us in, Jim's going to be launching a blog post on this very soon. We'll get an issue out as well so that you can comment directly. Now, something else, and I, I this just blew me away because Steve, I, I remember you and Rob Holt talking about this and I'm like, yeah, maybe someday, but may, let me let me just quickly show this and then, then you could dive in and just kind of, I'm gonna go to uh, a Linux box, just any Linux box. It's not running PowerShell or anything that, yeah, it's, it's, it's in Bluetooth on here uh, that I'm using WSL. And I'm going to run ls, and I'm going to hit dash, and I'm going to hit tab key. And oh, in 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 Linux, it will give me some some tab completion. But if I go into PowerShell, and uh, let's see, let me clear my screen. Ls dash. I'm 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 banging the, the tab key, Steve, and I'm not getting any help. And nor should I expect to get help, right? This is a Linux command. Why would I get help from it? But but here's the cool part. I'm going to bring up, uh, this is, happens to be on Mac. It doesn't really matter. Right? Um, if I do LS over here and I do dash and I hit the tab key, oh, I just got some completions. And if I bring up something like menu complete, it gives me some more information about it. This is very useful. This is uh, a Unix completers. Um, Talk a little bit about this, and as, as I bring up what the module is for it. Yeah, so Rob on the team actually saw a demo from the WSL team on something similar where they uh, basically pulled in Linux commands as proxy functions in the Windows. Uh, and from that demo, he actually created this uh, module, which you can get on the gallery today. Uh, basically, what it does is it leverages existing Bash and ZSH, Z Shell uh, completers on macOS. Um, so we're, we don't have to write these completers. They're just completers that already exist, written by the community, written as open source. And now, uh, if you're using a native command that has a completer, uh, this includes stuff like uh, group control, git, they all have completers usually published with them, uh, bash completers. Um, then this will just work with PowerShell. And again, uh, what Jason showed you is we also pull in, uh, pull in or create tooltips. So if you're using the main complete feature in PS3 line, you can actually get more information that you normally wouldn't even get in the bash scenario. And just so that you know, you can grab this and start testing this out right now. You can get it off the gallery. The module is called Microsoft.PowerShell.UnixCompleters. So you can download and grab that for you today. You need to make sure that either in your profile, you import the module, or if you're at the command line, you can run import Unix completers and then try it out as well. And it's it would be great. This is a great time for you to start working with it, trying it out and giving us some feedback on this as we continue our path on improving the shell and on modernizing the shell, maybe even getting a little into that next generation, maybe a little bit into this one um, with that. Um, a couple of side notes for this, and basically Steve and I have already covered it, but I wanted you to have some notes on these completers, again, where you can get the module and try out your favorite Linux commands with this. So, so on a Unix completers, because I, I, this happened recently, um, the Cloud Shell team has actually deployed this module by default in PowerShell Cloud Shell. So if you're using Cloud Shell with PowerShell, you get this automatically because that's, uh, Cloud Shell is running in a Linux environment. Um, and I'll just add one other thing that we didn't do, but uh, Jason Shirk did, who actually wrote the original PS3 line, is that uh, he doesn't want, uh, we were not leaving like Windows users out. If you install his module, which is an older module, uh, Tab Expansion++, plus plus, that actually includes completers for a lot of native Windows commands. So you can oh, get that from the gallery. Oh, that, that's even better. <laughs> now, Steve, one of the, and we were up to one of my favorite parts, not because this stuff isn't important. Matter of fact, this stuff is, is, is priceless, but this next thing is a little magical. Uh, predictive IntelliSense, it, is, it, it appears to be magical, but it's really not. This is actually a bit of a modernization that we're also adding our own spin into next gen as well and um well here let me just uh, uh show it really quick i'm here in powershell 7 on windows and i have no predictive uh intellisense right now just wanted to kind of show if i type start typing in get child for get child item 
and I start hitting the tab key, yeah, it completes it for me. If I type in get C, it'll start completing out a list of commandlets. Now I have my uh, Windows box set up for Emacs mode. That's why it gave me this list instead of cycling through them. But you kind of get the idea. This is very helpful and PowerShell has been helping me for a decade this way. But this is when things get a little bit different. So let me clear my screen and I'm gonna start working with get child item. I'm gonna start typing get, C. So in green, you see a suggestion here, a prediction here of what I might want. Steve, where is this prediction coming from? So currently in the uh, beta of PS921, which is what's included in the 7.1 previews, is, is looking in your uh, history. So this by itself is, uh, for me personally, has already been very highly uh, productive and useful because I do a lot of the same commands in Git, for example. Um, so it's able to save me a lot of typing time. So I think uh, the direction we're heading is that with this beta, you're seeing only from history and it's kind of very um, simple. I think it's most recently used. Uh, we're looking at adding some more intelligence to this so that we can actually leverage some, uh, finish some machine learning. So maybe it's the most often used commands in history um, and things like that. Well, I want to get back to one thing that you said, but this is pretty cool if you sit down and you start to play with it. Not only is it giving you a prediction from your history, but you can cycle through those predictions from where you're currently at. So if things that I've typed in with the word get-c. And so I can cycle through these. I can decide I don't want to do any of this. I can go back in and start working with this. And I can also move forward. Here's what I really like and has saved me considerable amount of time is I can start to accept the parameters and the arguments if that's what I wanted. But I, in this case, I'm gonna move backwards. I'm gonna say, no, I don't want size. I want this to be length. And let's get rid of this whole size thing. And it starts predicting from where I stop. So it found something in history where I used the property length and I can also cycle through these. Maybe there were other things. Oh, that's exactly what I was um, looking for. And one of the other points that, that Steve really brings up that I, I love the best, and he's, uh, this is the biggest thing for me, is when you're typing something, if it's what you want, it's really fast and easy to accept it. So it's an accelerator to getting to your solutions. But Steve, uh, you mentioned something, and it's early days on this, but you mentioned that this is more of an extensible framework that we're looking at and in, in trying to make for this. It's not just going to be your history. It's possible that we might be able to have additional providers like an ML provider. So let me see if I get this scenario right. You you kind of correct me here if I, but it, let's say that I'm a guy working in, I don't know, let's say I spend a lot of time working with Azure PowerShell, I'm working in Azure. Yep. If we had something like that, that could help predict things in Azure, um, that I, I'm thinking that could really accelerate me both on learning stuff that I don't know and getting through some of that coding really quick that way. That's definitely right. Like, I think from a, a vision and aspiration perspective, because uh, we'll see how far we go with this first iteration, is that we, we have separation of visualization, which is in PS Relang, and then we have the actual prediction uh, plugin model in PowerShell. So this will require uh, PowerShell 7.1 to get the predictions. Uh, the history prediction stuff will just work in PS Relang by itself currently. Um, but you know what Jason was kind of alluding to is if you're heavily using Azure, then we are working with the Azure team and say, hey, based on all the people who've ever used Azure PowerShell um, and some of those best practices, for a new user who's trying to maybe create a VM or manage a VM in some way, um, can you predict like what are they doing based on other operations they've done with Azure PowerShell already, right? And then now we can also work with Exchange Online, we can work with AWS, we can work with a lot of different teams and say, hey, you guys can build your own plugins. And once we're able to detect that we're in the domain of that set of commandlets, we cannot hand off predictions to that plugin because they'll do a better job than us just looking at history, right? Because history only is what you've done before. Um, with the amount of data that these other um, teams have, they could actually predict stuff that you haven't done ever before, but a lot of people have done and makes sense based on the context of what you're trying to do. Yeah, and what makes this so magical to me is I, I look at what you, what you just said and I'm thinking, well, first of all, that cuts down of my Bing time searching around the web for real world examples and all of that kind of stuff. And it helps me, you know, if I'm at the console investigating or exploring um, some technology, this really helps me move forward by being able to see what other people have successfully done to accomplish that task. So this is pretty amazing. A couple of quick notes. 
um, on this. And let me see if I can minimize is uh, a couple of quick notes on this is we do have an issue out there with, that you can comment on. We're going to be adding more to this issue because we have more to talk about in, in kind of in a lineup with predictive intelligence. There's another part to this. So it'll be kind of interesting. Now you can grab the PS read line right now. You can get it out of the gallery or as Steve mentioned in preview of seven one. Um, so please go out and comment to the issue. Talk to us about what you think. Um, about predictions and and how we're doing um, on this. And we'll keep you up to date out there. Now, something else that we're working on that works with the predictive IntelliSense, and this was this is gonna be really hard to show, but a DTS, Steve, uh, took a few minutes and, and, and made us a demo for this, and that's dynamic help. So predictive IntelliSense is kind of cool, but we wanna see if we can get more help. Uh, before we show this demo, do you want to preview any of this and then we'll just run it? Yeah, I think, uh, well, let me just say like the initial motivation was really thinking about how do we help users who are trying to figure out how to construct their pipeline without making them open a new window, a new tab, a new browser, whatever, so they can actually get help within the console. Because maybe you're on Cloud Shield or maybe you're on a phone and you have really limited screen real estate. Um, so we want to make that experience great. And in fact, if you use like Azure CLI interactive mode, uh, it's sort of like that. And hopefully we're, we're going to improve upon that experience. Yeah, that's a yeah, Azure CLI is doing something similar. Everybody take a look at this though. This is kind of interesting. So my greatest challenge has always been, and it hasn't been a big challenge. It's just that when I want to work with PowerShell, I need to have, well, two of them open because I spend half my time in help. But Here's what we're looking at right now and what Aditya put together. And you'll notice here as he starts to type a command, he's going to press the F1 key and see if this might remind some people of some things. It pops right into help and it's pageable help. So right from the command, you can pop right into help and escape right back to what you were typing. And here's a better example. As he starts to type a parameter and then presses F1, it goes right to that parameter in the help file. I mean, that's pretty cool, isn't it? So you can get the help that you need right away at the command line when you're typing it, and we'll have a quicker version of the help so that you can see, uh, this is more like the tool tips that you might see in menu complete, where you can see just a little bit of help to get you moving forward, or you can go in and read the full help. I, Steve, I think that this right now, as, as a demonstration, I'm pretty impressed and while I really want a prototype in my hand to play with, I think this could be really helpful on the constant bouncing around to help files. And worse, what I always hated was bouncing out to the web for stuff. So I'm thinking this could be pretty useful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like if you if you look at that demo, he, he showed a very simple Git process, but imagine that you have a very complex pipeline and you're like all the way on a second line or you know closer to the right edge of the screen. Uh, you don't want to have to like control C uh, to kind of uh, close that out so you can do like a get help command. So uh, doing the F1 full screen help is actually very useful. And just so you know, we have to implement our own pager to make that work. And so we're probably going to look at separating that out so you can just use it for general purposes. And we'll enhance that so you can have like search and highlight and all that stuff later. Uh, but even for the, uh, it was, I think he had bound it to like Alt H or something to get like the minimal help. Like all that help information is actually being pulled out of the um, updatable help mammal today. So as long as that has good content, we can actually, for any commandlet that has that published, we can actually pull that information out. I think if you start, um, you know, as we start to look at this and the pieces start to come together, I think it's gonna be very interesting as everyone gets a chance to start to see these pieces come together and comment on it, to see how this overall will both improve the experience for both new users as they're learning PowerShell and helping them, but, but also the advanced users where we're, we're investigating new technologies and we're trying to get things um, typed in and we're trying to figure out you know, what that particular technology wants. Things like predictive intelligence and dynamic help, I think can move me down that pipeline into a solution a lot faster. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about the work that we're doing right now. Um, Hey Steve, did, guess what? We're at the end. I mean, we're we we literally we're we're at the end. It was it was that quick. What do you think? 
No, I'm pretty excited about a lot of the work we're doing. I mean, this is obviously it's just one topic um, versus all the other sessions that we have. So this is just a small portion of what the overall team is working on. Um, and this doesn't even cover some of the uh, bugs or issues we'll fix in terms of like the shell experience. Um, this focus is really more on what is coming in the, in the future. Like what is the next gen of shell looks like, right? And I think having these improvements on the interactive experience is very critical to make people more productive. And again, as what Jason mentioned, this is for both beginners learning PowerShell and also for advanced users who are well uh, accustomed to PowerShell to make them even more productive. And in this brief session, this brief, brief session, I want to point out what Steve just said. There's a lot of things that we're working on. This is just one session of stuff. So it's very exciting. We've got a lot of work that we're doing out there, a lot of work still to do, but it's all really exciting work and it's out there to help everybody. And we need your feedback now. This is the beautiful part about being an open source product is we can talk about this so that we can talk with you and so that you can talk with us so that we can make this better for everyone. Everybody's got good ideas. Well, everybody's got ideas, right, Steve? <laughs> right. Well, let me just uh, close this off uh, right here and say, well, thank you, everybody. And Steve, it was a true pleasure to work with you. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we'll still keep working together, so I'm not worried about that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's even the best part. Thanks, everybody. Have a great PS Confi you. Bye.